All right, let's get on with tonight's announcements. Um, as I mentioned, this is part of our partnership with NPS and the Parks Conservatory. And we have, we do almost every month, we partner and do an event and we call them Nature Boosts. So it is Climate Action Month as well as National Poetry Month. So we have a lot of events um, celebrating poetry and uh, I hope that our events for climate are hopeful and will get you through what is trying and um, hard to get through. And we hope all of our events do that. So we want to acknowledge, our library wants to acknowledge that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Rami Tushaloni people, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homelands. And as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramyatush community. And our tech host, Lisa, has just placed a link in the chat box that you can use to look up what native land you are occupying tonight, if it's not a loading land. We have some amazing events coming up are on the same page, which is San Francisco Public Library's bi-monthly read, where we encourage all of San Francisco to read the same book. We have the amazing Pulitzer Prize winning Natalie Diaz, yes, a poet for our, our on the same page. We have not done a book of poetry for this campaign. So I'm super excited. Tuesday, April 26th in conversation with the amazing educator and author and post-punk rock drummer, Michelle Cruz Gonzalez. So excited, please come to that event. For National Poetry Month, we have Derek Austin and Keith Wilson in conversation, and this is part of our um, African American Center, and you can see right there, third floor, 100 Larkin Street, in person, come on down, and another, in-person African-American Center uh, event, celebrating Bay Area Black Poet Laureates, including our one and only Tongo Ison Martin, Devorah Major, and word slanger, I'm, I'm blanking on her full name, but she is Oakland Poet Laureate right now. You can get her book from um, Nomadic Press. Saturday morning, we have these two amazing, beautiful humans, and they're going to be talking about nature and art and looking at that through verses of the Quran. So I'm very excited about these two brilliant humans. Come check it out. Monday night, Smart Water Gardening, another in-person event with ex-librarian Jim Van Buskirk, and we'll be looking at earthquakes in San Francisco movies. And then two super fun events I can't wait for. On Earth Day, we'll be having, well, two events with these two amazing humans, Annie Sprinkle and Beth Stevens, scholars, educators, and sex educators. So Friday on Earth Day on the Larkin Street Steps, we'll be doing an Earth Day sidewalk eco-sex clinic. And the same thing, talking about um, the disasters of climate, but how do we get through this and how do we still find pleasure in our life and knowing that these things are happening and embracing that these things are happening and doing something about it, but also still finding pleasure. So we also will be joining um, Annie and Beth on a eco-sex walking tour and we'll be meeting at Bernal Heights Library Sunday, April 24th, 2 p.m. and going around to Holly Park and loving nature. The amazing Emily St. John Mandel will be in conversation with Anna Lee Newitz. This is a partnership with San Mateo County Public Libraries. And Emily St. John Mandel is the author of Stations 11, also the HBO optioned TV series. All right, that's it. That's all of my announcements coming up at the library. And I wanna um, thank you all again for being here tonight. We have a great presentation. You can either use the chat box for your questions or you can use the Q&A feature, but it's a nice intimate crowd. So nothing will get lost in the chat for sure. Share your thoughts. And tonight we have Marin Headland Rangers, Lara and Sakaro. Uh, did I mangle it? Socorro, Socorro. You got it, Socorro, you got it, you got it. 
going to dive. I, every time I read this sentence too, I'm just like envisioning you two diving into the Rodeo Lagoon. <laughs> Um, and we're going to learn about the unique system, their ecosystem, and um, how it's going to evolve with climate change, and together learn about the geology and wildlife, and brainstorm how we can continue to protect people and places like this from being harmed, and issues facing our environment. And I, I feel like this event, too, is one of those ones where, yes, there's some drastic things happening, but there's also hope. And um, together, I love the together part, together we brainstorm and how to continue to protect our, ourselves and our people and the people we love and the places we love and the places we live. All right, Laura and Socorro, take it away. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank All you right. so much. Thank Let me get the screen share up. All right, if you're all able to see that, take it away, Socorro. Yes, so hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Socorro Cardoso. My pronouns are she, her, ella. And I am based at the Marin Headlands, which is part of Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And today we're going to dive into a changing climate at Rodeo Lagoon. I'm joined with another wonderful ranger. Um, ranger Lara, can you come off mute and introduce yourself for us, please? Hello, good evening. My name is Lara. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a ranger in the Marin Headlands telling you the stories alongside Socorro and very excited to be with you all today. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the purpose of this presentation is to understand how Rodeo Lagoon's unique ecosystem is projected to evolve with climate change. Um, we will cover topics such as our local watersheds um, in the Bay Area and our unique um, one-of-a-kind geology that makes up the marine headlands. And finally, the wildlife um, that swims in the Rodeo Lagoon's brackish waters. So we could hit the next slide, please. So before diving into um, you know, the material, I'd like also to do a land acknowledgement um, to acknowledge the first indigenous peoples of this land that we're gonna be talking about today. The Coast Miwok have been around since time and memoriam, and they are the first protectors and caretakers of this land. Um, we are currently working from home. So we're also, um, I would also like to acknowledge that um, we are on a lonely land and um, we hope to follow their examples in honoring this land. Um, and thank you for joining me in that land acknowledgement. So next slide, please. Um, so moving forward here, um, where is Rodeo Lagoon, right? Where is it located? So if you gravitate your attention to the California County map on the left, there is a red, yeah, thank you. There is a red um, highlighted county that is Marin County. And if we zoom in even closer to the map on our right side, um, that is where the Marine Headlands is located. So it is the Northern Peninsula of the Bay Area known as the Marine Peninsula. And if we zoom in even closer, thank you. Um, um, this is an image of the Western side of the peninsula. Um, so it is on the North side of the Point Bonita Lighthouse. And just to give you an idea of the size of it, the lagoon is about four miles um, wide, so pretty small, pretty big, um, depending on who you talk to. Um, and let's dive into, um, so next slide here, please. So let's dive into some of the ecology. So we're going to be talking about ecology. And so um, ecology essentially is everything connects with everything. So it's... Um, these uh, principles of ecology you want to dive into. Um, and you're going to continue hearing this theme um, throughout our presentation that talks about interconnectivity and interdependence of biotic and abiotic, um, which are living and non-living things that make up the area around the lagoon and in the lagoon. Um, and we're going to be interweaving these concepts of water, land, um, that really characterize the lagoon um, while we're associating it with concepts of um, climate change. So we're going to dive into how will the lagoon be affected if climate change continues? How will it look like in the future? And so our ask to you is to relate what you see in this community with your own. So what 
what um so what i want to ask you is what can you pull from this ecosystem that reminds you of your own and how do you see yourself as part of this ecosystem so what is your role um so next slide here so a great segue to talk about interconnectivity um is this fluidity of water, right? Water is life. And so um, here we have an image of our local Bay Area watersheds. Um, and again, it's showing us that peninsula, that Marin Peninsula um, north of San Francisco. And um, it's broken down into three main watersheds here. The very top one, the one on the north, is our, thank you, is our um, Redwood Creek watershed. The one in the middle is our Tennessee um, Creek watershed. And finally, the one on the bottom, the one on the south, is our um, Rodeo Creek watershed. And so these systems flow throughout Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And um, a huge component of where this water comes from is one Tamlapais. Um, so because we're talking about Rodeo Lagoon, I want to just center our attention um, to Rodeo Creek. So this creek has approximately two main drainages that form that form from the north and south of the lagoon, um, and this water flows into it, creating the lagoon that we have today. And not just that, during certain times of the year, there's also um, the Pacific Ocean that will merge and become part of this lagoon, and we'll be diving into into that some more with um, Ranger Lara. And so this this abiotic factor, right? We talked about abiotic factors being non living things, is what give life to um, the aquatic species that are in the lagoon um, that we'll be diving into some more as well. So next slide, please. Yeah, so why should we care, right? Um, so um, a statement here we, we'd like to put out is that the National Park Service believes in protecting people and these places um, from being harmed by issues facing our environment. Um, and protection means actively reducing risks. So what, so what we encourage is to be vigilant when coming when it comes to safeguarding the, the watersheds that we talk about, that we depend on, right? And we don't want them to be harmed. And um, a big reason for that is um, for them to be preserved for future generations to come and for them to also enjoy the beauty of these watersheds. Um, and um, we'll be diving into now, um, if we could go into the next slide, please. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we're going to be diving into what happens when these environmental changes like temperature increases happen rapidly. Um, and what is climate change? I think you know some of us have an idea of what it is. And um, I'd like to just break that down for us and hopefully have a metaphor here so you can walk away remembering what it is. Um, so here we have our earth, you know, just chilling here. Um, and it has something very special. It has an atmosphere. And so this atmosphere, atmosphere acts like a blanket, right? Just like the blankets that keep us warm. Um, and um, the, these, this atmosphere, this blanket, what it does, it protects us from solar radiation, right? Dangerous direct solar radiation um, reaching us, but it also keep, keeps Earth happy. And what do I mean by that? <laughs> so if we pay attention to this diagram. We see our sun, right? Our sun is bringing in um, some solar radiation, bringing in some sun rays, right? It's coming in. This is normal. Um, and it stays in that atmosphere. And we could see that really, um, there's a nice really um, picture of that on the left side of what I'm talking about. Um, and so that, that heat stays in our atmosphere. But what happens is some of it stays with us, but the rest of it bounces back into space right, passes back into space. Actually, the majority of it bounces back into space. And this is what keeps our Earth cool. Now, if we look at the right side of this diagram, thank you, um, this is where the equilibrium of Earth gets disrupted, meaning Earth is not happy, right? And so what's happening here, we got our solar radiation going in, normal, right? 
But we got now this thick layer, now this thick blanket. It kind of reminds me of those really heavy weighted blankets um, that were like in this, this like December or, or like two Decembers ago. Um, but this thick weighted blanket now covers our earth. Um, and what is happening there? So there are these gases. Maybe you heard the term greenhouse gases. And so these greenhouse gases um, are also um, specifically known as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrose oxide. Um, and they get hold in our atmosphere. Um, and so what happens is instead of it bouncing back into space, more, more of it is getting trapped. And so that is creating that thick um, atmosphere, that, that thick layer there, that thick blanket. And that's what's keeping us warm. <laughs> so um, to just recap that, um, and a good way to remember that is that these greenhouse gases act as a heat trapping blanket that is making earth sick and unhappy, so sad. Um, and what is, what is, so I, I'd like to talk about what is happening to earth that's making it so grumpy and sad lately. So let's dive into that. Thank you. Um, so it starts off, um, starts off actually um, with one specific um, particular species. Um, maybe you've heard of them, humans. Um, and <laughs> um, uh, before getting into that though, um, I'd, I'd like to talk about why is climate change happening? And um, also mention that these fluctu fluctuating, you know, um, cycles of warm and cold, warm and cold that are happening um, are normal. So what I'm saying with that is that Earth has experienced these fluctuating um, temperatures and, and climate. And um, that's why we have ice ages. And that's why then um, there's warming. So this has happened in the past. Um, but what is not normal, it's that it's happening um, um, rapidly, but also it is just increasing right now. And um, one, one reason for that is because um, here we have a map of the world and human population um, from, 17, from the 1700s, 2018. And um, as humans started to expand more, they started to build more and then they expanded more and then built more and then expanded more and built more. Um, and so, and so that's, that's kind of um, what started being part of um, the issue, um, but not just that, it's how we're using our resources, right? Not just human expansion, but it's how we're using these resources. Um, so when we burn fossil fuels, um, to make electricity, that causes um, these green gases to increase. When we burn oil to make our cars and planes move, that increases those greenhouses gases, greenhouse gases. And then if we cut trees for agriculture, that is also not helping this equilibrium that Earth wants, right? It wants to be happy. Um, and um, in the long term, it causes these, these long term effects in our climate to just keep increasing. And so during our time together, we're going to talk about how these impacts manifest in different ways throughout the Rodeo Lagoon community. Um, and I'm going to be diving into the geology portion and Laura's going to be diving into the ecology portion of the lagoon. Um, so let's get into that. So next slide, please. Awesome. So here we have um, some really neat stuff happening. It's one of my favorite things. So um, I like to think of rocks as storytellers. So rocks tell stories, right? They are the storytellers of the land of Earth. And if we look at rocks, they help us understand the geology, and in particular, this one of the um, Rodeo Beach and Rodeo Lagoon. And so if we date back, to 200 million years. Here we have two plates. Um, yes, someone said they love rocks. Yes, um, love it. Um, so, okay, so we have, you have these two plates coming together, right? We have the Fairlawn plate and we have the North American plate. 
they are coming and they are colliding. And this happened about 500 million years ago. And when they're coming together, something really neat happens. So the Fairland Plate is carrying those rock formations that make up the Marin Headlands and, and San Francisco Peninsula. And as it's coming in, it sinks because the ocean floor is denser than land. So that's what causes this plate to sink. So the Fairland Island basically gets consumed by Earth. It goes back into our mantle, no longer exists. And as this is happening, the North American plate is being pushed up which is causing these beautiful hills to form that are right behind me, and, um, and these cliffs to form throughout the Marin Headlands and also the San Francisco um, Peninsula. All right, and let's see, am I missing anything from that part? Mm, I don't think so. So that's kind of the creation of the Marin Headlands and also um, specifically of Rodeo Lagoon. Um, so mainly it was those two plates subducting, creating that uplift, um, which caused a lot of these hills to form. So next slide, please. Great, so now if we add climate change into this picture and if we fast forward a little bit here, um, I have two images here. And the one on the left depicts the time period when Coast Miwok peoples would walk to the Fairland Islands. So this is about um, 10,000 years ago. And then the picture or the image on the right depicts Rodeo Lagoon now, so in 2022. And um, if we center our attention into these two pictures and we compare them and contrast them, my ask here is in the chat, can you put, what do you see? So for example, just what do you see? So let's see, I see, I see people. So what do you see? So in the chat, please chime in. What do you see in these two images? Let's try to compare and contrast them. So I'm seeing um, different, oh, okay, <laughs> happening fast, okay. Um, I'm seeing differences in the amount of water, awesome. Um, beach blankets, hills, grasses, awesome. Um, differences in amount of water, beach blankets. Uh, da -da -da -da. Um, canoes, yeah, there's some canoes, right? Um, upthrust of hills and filled in lagoon, um, big rock, a crop, yeah. Broad and sign, yeah. No sun, sunbathers in number one, LOL. <laughs> yeah, and um, let's see, different, different substrates, grassland on the left and sand on the right. Awesome, uh, yeah. Fog. Oh yeah, there's some fog. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for chiming in. That is great. And um, I noticed, yeah, that some of us pointed out um, the the sea level, right? And that that's. I mean, there's so many. There's a lot of things happening here, right? But I, I really want us to gravitate our attention to the sea level. So if you notice here, and maybe Laura, you could help me here point out the sea level from image one um, compared to image two here. Thank you. Um, we could see that it's pretty drastic. Um, and to be completely honest with you, again, we expected there to be some sort of sea level rise just because that's how earth works. Um, and so we, we knew that this was bound to happen, but what we didn't know was how rapidly this was going to happen. And that's the issue here. So if sea level um, continues to rise at a rate that it's currently rising, the Pacific Ocean will eventually consume Rodeo Beach and in turn consume Rodeo Lagoon, um, causing these direct, um, direct impacts with the aquatic animals that are there. So it will cause them to either migrate or be non-existent of this area. Um, and then again, Laura will be diving into more of the ecology aspect of the lagoon. Um, and so, um, so this eventually will lead to Rodeo Lagoon being a relic of our memories. 
And um, if we hit the next slide here, there is um, a story that I, I really like. It's one of my favorite stories. And it was created by my predecessor, um, park ranger Roxy Farewell. And it's called, Where is Cornelian Beach? And as I'm reading this, I'd like for you all um, to just see if you could find some of these parallels between Cornelian Be Beach, and this is a real story, um, to Rodeo Lagoon. And we're not really gonna um, like dive into the chat, but I just want you to listen and point those out. All right, so here I go. <clears throat> the silver haired veteran of World War II asked for my existence in locating the beach where, the, where he remembered gathering abundant, beautiful orange stones in the 1940s. I must be in the wrong place, he said. I thought I was stationed here at Fort Cronkite during the war. The barracks and beach look so familiar, but I must be in the wrong place for I cannot find the orange stones I hope to show my granddaughter today. I'd sadly explained that Rodeo Beach is a beach of his memories. The beautiful Cornelians are no longer abundant. In fact, now they are quite rare. Decades of gatherers have gleaned the beach of these vibrant stones, making the old name Cornelian Beach a relic of earlier times. The geo geologic process that brought the Cornelians trapped within ancient pillow lavas is no longer here today. The great slobs of ocean floor on which these rocks journeyed had been consumed, right, consumed and recycled deep into the earth the Cornelians will know, will not return. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sad story, but it's also, it's, it's also true. So um, now if you walk Cornelian Beach, you are very lucky if you find those tiny and you can see some of those pebbles here. Um, um, there are these beautiful jewels, orange jewels, um, and you're very lucky if you spot one. And um, I don't know, when I, when I was reading this, it reminded me a lot of what could happen to Rodeo Lagoon. Um, so hopefully you were able to point out some of those differences um, and similarities. Um, and I'd like to hear from you. So in our next slide here, um, what is something that you'll miss if it were to disappear? So in the chat, what is something that you'll miss if it were to disappear? Redwoods, Golden Gate Park, um, windmill, ooh, bird diversity, Chrissy Field. Yeah, that's good. What else y'all, what is something else? Beaches, yeah, that's a good one. Embarcadero, yeah. No, wait a couple more seconds here. I love hanging out at Rodeo Beach and watching the waves crash um, on the rocks and all of the shore birds. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Sea otters, yay, we'll be talking about sea otters shortly. Um, the airport, mm, yeah, that, that's, that hits home for me too. Um, cool, all right. Okay, I wanna be respectful of people's time. And so um, I've had a rockin' time with you all. I've had to add a pun there. Um, so I'm gonna give um, the baton to Ranger Lara now, who's gonna walk us through um, the ecological impacts of the Rodeo Lagoon and how they're being impacted by climate change. So take it away, Lara. Thank you so much, Socorro. Um, I'm gonna give you a pun right back. Uh, you just laid a fantastic foundation for us to understand the geology underlying our park. Um, and I'm excited to kind of dive into the ecology that's building on top of that. So looking at Rodeo Lagoon, this is a really special place. And I'm not just saying that because I work there. It has a special mix of just the right ingredients to be a biodiversity hotspot. So we're looking at Rodeo Lagoon right here. And to begin, it's brackish. So what that means is that the lagoon is a mix of fresh water from that watershed that Socorro had described, 
and salt water coming in from Rodeo Beach from the Pacific Ocean. And this combination of these two conditions interacting means that we get a lot of species here that specialize precisely in these brackish conditions. Rodeo Lagoon, it's a 40 acre lagoon and it's pretty shallow. The depths are only between two and six feet during the late fall, it changes seasonally. Vegetation includes fennel pondweed, sedges and algae. It has a mix of substrates all around it, some sand and some muck. Um, and there's a lot of edge habitats colliding right here, like a mosaic. What that means is we get a lot of different microhabitats coming together, like a, like a quilt maybe. We have coastal prairie, chaparral, riparian willow, sand dunes and the beach. And what that means is we get a lot of different species that can extract resources from all of these ecotones meshing together. We call them edge species. It's no coincidence that this is a biodiversity hotspot for that reason. It's no coincidence that we get one fourth of all North American bird species passing through the lagoon at some point. That is a record, uh, a record thing to say. It's definitely a birding hotspot and it's a species hotspot. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that this place is special. It's a combination of habitats right at the mouth of a watershed, and it creates a lot of unique interspecies interactions. And I'm about to walk us through one of those interactions. We're going to talk about a food web that starts with fish to turtles to river otters. We're going to learn about the science that goes along every step of the way of studying these animals. And we're going to learn how they're going to change with climate change. But before I get to our first animal, it's brackish, like I said, and that is because every so often the lagoon breaches. So here's a video of what that looks like. Um, when we get a lot of rain, we're gonna see the ocean connecting with the lagoon like it is right here. Um, and that's when that salt water is gonna kind of come in and mix with that fresh water from Mount Tamapai. Um, And we have our first species to start with is the tidewater goby. This is an adorable fish, if I dare say so myself. And this fish lives in brackish water, only in brackish water. It actually only lives in lagoons in California. This is an endemic California fish. And its range is all the way from the northernmost California County, all the way down to San Diego. And this range is discontinuous. So there's a lot of little tiny little populations all along our coast wherever there happens to be a brackish lagoon, like Rodeo Lagoon. And these lagoons, they're seasonal, they exist in flux. So it means the Tidewater goby is pretty fragile and it actually is an endangered species. So we're monitoring it as a critically endangered species. It's still found all along the California coast, but about 17% of its populations have been extirpated and 52% of their populations are so small and degraded that their long-term survival is pretty uncertain. Um, so what we're doing is we are monitoring these species as an endangered species. Their population in our lagoon is pretty good. The issue is more looking at lagoons across the state and protecting these lagoons so that these populations can continue to thrive. And the way that we know this is we are studying them. Um, here you can see a picture of a person. Basically that means this field techs are gonna go out in the lagoon they're gonna walk this person, scoop it up, and they're gonna count all of the gobies to see that the populations are doing well. They're going to see how many parasites these gobies may have. And they're gonna see what parts of the lagoon they're living in. Are they in sandy substrate? Are they in mucky substrate? Do they like those sedges? Do they not like those sedges? Answering these questions means we know what parts of the lagoon to better restore to promote the health of this species. So that's our first kind of link in this chain. We have the Tidewater goby. Um, the next link is we have Western pond turtles. Western pond turtles are the only native freshwater turtle in California. And they disappeared from the Marin Headlands in the 1990s due to a combination of over harvest and habitat loss and invasive species. And this went on for about 20 years. So around 2020, it was clear that this species was missing from this ecosystem that we're trying to restore. And so the Park Service decided to reintroduce them. The way we did that is we collected eggs from Point Reyes where the populations are good and healthy. We reared these eggs at the San Francisco Zoo in partnership with Sonoma State University. And then in 2020, we had 20 baby turtles that we released into the lagoon. 
And we're studying them today by tracking them with radio telemetry. So what that means is that each turtle, they have a little radio tracker glued onto their shells. And we go out there in kayaks and waders with a big antenna and we tune into turtle talks. Um, they each have their own frequency. So we can see how they're moving across the landscape. We can see what of those micro habitats they're preferring. And if we see that one's been in one place for too long, that's when we're gonna be perhaps suspicious that it's not doing too well. We'll go find it. And if it's sick or injured, we'll take it to the zoo for rehabilitation and then release it back into the habitat until this population is stable. So this is a very exciting conservation victory in process. We have those gobies, we have these turtles and they are carnivorous. So they're gonna eat those gobies and perhaps other fish as well. And then we have something that eat those turtles. We have river otters. River otters, similar to the turtles, they had also disappeared from the Bay Area due to a combination of things, trapping, pollution, lack of prey and habitat loss. And it wasn't until the early 2000s that we started to see them come back. River otters, just like humans, they're what we call an indicator species. It means they're very sensitive to pollution. And that's because they're at the top of the food chain. So when there's a pollutant in the environment, and there's a small little creature, it's not gonna impact it that much. But something eats that creature, something eats that creature, something eats that, and so forth. And by the time it gets to the top apex predators, like otters or humans, that pollution is so bioaccumulated that we're gonna get sick. So the fact that river otters are so sensitive to pollution and they disappear, but they came back without us having to reintroduce them, is a living example that taking care of our watersheds and stewarding our environment works. We have cleaner, healthier water and the otters came back. So it's very special to see them now. Um, and there's an awesome thing called the River Otter Ecology Project. If you ever see an otter, you can report it to them. And they are the scientists studying this right now, primarily. Um, but they're kind of the end link of this food chain. So to look at this food chain, we have gobies to turtles, to otters. Otters do eat those turtles. Um, and all together, they're species that rely on each other. I've been seeing things in the chat, but I haven't been able to read it. So I'm just gonna look to see if I missed any questions. What is brackish water? It's salty and fresh water combined. So it's not as salty as the ocean, not as fresh as a river. Um, have there been any sick turtles? So there was one turtle that hadn't moved for five weeks and we were worried that he was sick. So we looked all, we looked for like maybe a week or two for this turtle. And we were finding him in this one area not moving. So we dug down in the mud and we dug pretty deep. We finally retrieved him. Um, he was really small. Um, he should have been bigger. So that was proof that he wasn't eating. But so we just kind of moved him into the middle of the lagoon. And uh, he's been moving around since. Um, and I think there was another one that had to be taken back to the zoo as well. But I wasn't a part of finding that one. Um, otters. Have there been many sick turtles? Only two, if you count the one that we dug up and the one we took to SF Zoo. So they're doing pretty good. Awesome. Okay, so that is our food chain. And now we're gonna kind of look at how this food chain may be predicted to change with climate change. So how will climate change impact the lagoon? As Socorro described earlier, we have this heat trapping blanket. So when we burn fossil fuels for energy, such as coal or oil or natural gas, we add to this blanket surrounding the atmosphere and we thicken it. And as it gets thicker, it traps more heat underneath. With warmer temperatures, water naturally expands. So warmer temperature, the ocean will expand, leading to sea level rise. And even a small rise in sea level can result in more frequent and intense flooding events. So this image of, um, or this video of Rodeo Lagoon breaching, this is something that naturally occurs but it's gonna happen more and more frequently with sea level rise and climate change. As a result, the lagoon is gonna become saltier and colder. Those gobies are gonna get washed out to the ocean more often and they can't survive in the ocean. They need brackish water and they're pretty fragile. So we may lose them. The turtles depend on them. The otters depend on the turtle. We can see this cascading event. There are things we can do and we're gonna talk about that. But before we do, I have a question for you all. My question is, what changes have you noticed in the place that you live? 
you wouldn't mind popping that into chat. Let's see if some questions too that I missed. Um, while we wait for those answers, I see, are you concerned about the otters eating the radio tracking devices? Yeah, I mean, when I've seen otters eat turtles, um, they usually leave the shell and they kind of nibble off the head and the feet. Um, it's a little gruesome, but they're, they're not going to eat the shell. So, and that's where the, the radio tracker is glued on top of the shell. Um, okay, let's see. What changes have you noticed in the place that you live? More wildfires. Certainly. Absolutely. King tides. Yeah. Sea level rise. We get more, even more extreme king tides. Hotter summers. Definitely. Less fog, and that's a that's a scary one. Um, I live in Pacifica, and those apartments fall into the ocean. Infrastructure is a huge issue to try to deal with with sea level rise. Um, my garden flowers and veggies are blooming earlier than in past years. Yes, absolutely. Those phenological changes. Um, timing is going to get a little mismatched, and some species won't be able to catch up with your garden that's blooming faster than maybe they are hatching their eggs. Smoke and air quality certainly. Spring bloom coming earlier, very little rain, decrease in salmon upstream. I see some fire emojis, um, hotter weather, drought, warmer winters, more crows. I, I'm curious about that one. I want to have a conversation about that. Um, I would like to know what's bringing more crows. That kind of seems like a good thing. I like corvids. Um, okay, these are all things that we, are, that we just touched, that we have just touched on that's in this next slide. Um, so this is kind of gleaned from the climate change report that our park scientists just put together of how Golden Gate is predicted to change with climate change. We're going to get more rain, but it's going to happen less often. And what that is, that's an atmospheric river. So we're going to get all of our rain all at once, and then we'll have these periods of drought. So even though we're getting more rain, we need it to be kind of equally spread across the season for plants to successfully take it up. We get it all at once, then we get drought, and of course it's going to lead to wildfire, like we have all had to deal with these past few years especially. We're also getting ocean current changes, different patterns of upwelling. There is predicted to be less fog, which could devastate the redwoods that are up in your woods. And as all of these things interact and change, there's gonna get people who are not able to rely on resources successfully. And climate change refugees is a question that we'll all have to navigate together of as we get people displaced from their homes. Like we just had in that comment, those homes falling into the ocean. It's a lot. When I talk to climate change communicators, I always ask, what can we do and how can we have hope? It's easy to get bogged down. Um, and it's something that I often think about. There are things we can do. And I always try to remind myself that there are people out there working on these things every day and there are successes being made. River otters have returned. Our tangible actions are adding up. So when we look at solutions, we usually divide it into three categories. We have energy shifts, reduce your demand and talk about it. So we look at energy shifts. In Golden Gate National Recreation Area, we rely on 100% renewable energy. That's a combination of things. That's thanks to on-site generation via solar panels at Alcatraz Island and Fort Mason. And then we also are opted into a CCA or a community choice aggregate. So CCAs are alternatives to the standard energy providers like PG&E or SoCal Edison. And um, you can look into your county if they have a CCA. These are, they provide clean energy and it's a community solution. Um, when it comes to reducing your demand, we've been looking at shuttles to bring folks up to your woods. We live in your own life. You can look at advocating for bike routes and things like that. And then the third one, talk about it, is one that I think is perhaps undervalued, but it's something that I never try to forget because every time that I bring up climate change, like I'm doing right now, words spread really quickly from me to you, to our family and friends. And the more we talk about it and keep it at the forefront of our minds, the more we're going to empower others to raise it in topics of conversation. It's possible to make the easy choice, the sustainable choice within our decision-making framework. And there's tons of counties and cities and local areas, including our own in San Francisco, that have already made huge strides on this. And that's gonna add up, but our, just talking about it and having these conversations is such an essential part of that. One last nugget of hope I would like to add 
is we need to make sure that the solutions we're offering to others are equitable. Sometimes these solutions are expensive. Sometimes they're not feasible. And climate change isn't going to impact everyone equally. There are unequal impacts of climate change across people. In the Park Service, we have this mission to preserve unimpaired habitats for future generations. That often means that we're preserving the past, but the past is changing. Climate change won't allow things to stay the same. What do we restore to in a post-colonial world? Will climate change give us the opportunity perhaps to reimagine what our parks look like and break away from that colonial mold? We can imagine a park where sustainable shuttles bring people who don't have cars into natural spaces. We can imagine a park where everyone is able to recognize the way that their personal histories tie in with that park, not just the histories of select few environmentalists that we choose to champion. We need to look at restoration moving forward, and that's going to mean that we need to manage our landscapes differently. Climate change may inhibit us from our mission of protecting the past, but we can use this as an opportunity to rethink and redesign who feels welcome in outdoor spaces and what our outdoor spaces will evolve into. That about ends our discussion. We would love to do some Q&A and chatting with you, but I would like to thank you so much for joining us today. National parks are your parks. And by being here today, you are choosing the stories that will continue to tell in years to come. Um, so Cora and I, we're in the Marin Headlands every day. Come visit us at the Point Benita Lighthouse or the Visitor Center or the Nike Missile Site. Um, but yeah, let's, let's dive into some questions, shall we? I think there's already a few in the chat I've probably missed. Um, Anissa, I don't know if, if you want to facilitate this or Socorro and I can kind of tag team. Hi. So I looked into your Q, the Q&A and I think you covered those. I think you both did a great job of answering questions as we went along, as well as I love when attendees help attendees with questions. It's one of my favorite things. So there were some very knowledgeable folks in our audience tonight as well. So some new questions coming in, awesome presentation. I have wondered, um, yes, they're flying. I wondered what is the source of pollution for the river otters in, Rode in the Rodeo Lagoon? That's an interesting question. Um, there's a lot of military history in the Marine Headlands. Um, I mentioned the Nike missile site where Socorro and I work. It's a Cold War site. Um, and it wasn't always stewarded as a national park. So a big source of pollution for the otters in Rodeo Lagoon was actually fuel for these nuclear missiles we had in the Marin Headlands. It was a mix of JP4 jet fuel and red fuming nitric acid. And to explain how corrosive that is, if you had a vat of this open in your garage, it would peel the paint off of your neighbor's garage. The missileers would wear hazmat suits to change out the fuel in these missiles. And this fuel was drained directly into Rodeo Lagoon. Um, this is a story that I heard from one of our veterans. So that of course is a huge source of pollution for Rodeo Lagoon. There was a while before this park became a park, it was gonna be called Mar Marincello. It's gonna be the most beautiful planned community in the world. And uh, grassroots activists eventually made this a park instead. But their plan was to use Rodeo Lagoon as um, uh, a sewage dumping site. So, and they've already, they'd already started construction for Marinchello a little bit. So uh, basically that's a long way of saying that Rodeo Lagoon wasn't always looked to as a lagoon or an ecosystem. It was kind of looked to as a way to uh, get rid of waste. Um, so that of course would have been a pollutant for river otters, but they have returned today. There is a family in Rodeo Lagoon right now. Thank you. Can I also just say how um, how wonderful it is you bring up like your your elder uh, rangers and and bring them into the story and just what they know and what they've shared with you and how you keep bringing that back. I love that. All right, let's get back to these questions though. Let's see. Uh, ba -ba -ba -bum. One thing we can do and Tom, thank you. Whoever Tom is, is Tom an MPS because he's very knowledgeable. One thing we can do to fight climate change is to help our parks is to drive our cars less. E-bikes make many trips, like make as many trips as possible, even getting to the park. Get more at info, and I'll throw this in the chat. Oh, he already threw it in the chat, but I'll put it in our doc as well. 
Um, is it possible to get a copy of this presentation? Kat, thank you. This is one of our number one questions. This is being streamed live on YouTube and I will find the link. It's in our, these two links are all of the information you will need about tonight's event. Here we go, everyone. Here we go, the YouTube link and the link for tonight's question. I mean, for tonight, sorry, for tonight's question. And the, um, the link for tonight's document, which has like links to NPS and those upcoming events I talked about. And I do want to say we are, you mentioned the shuttles, um, SFPL does partner with NPS on shuttles. So look for that coming summer at your local library, neighborhood library branch. Um, doo -doo. I saw the bomb squad van at Rodeo about a week ago. I assume that means that they may be some old ordinance still around leaching into the watershed. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I know that there's folks monitoring the water qualities in Rodeo Lagoon pretty frequently. At least there's NPS folks. Um, yeah, I've always been curious about what sort of pollutants we've inherited in this park. Yeah, Bay Area. I mean, you mentioned the military. I mean, that was all over the Bay Area, right? We're just mm -hmm. a hub for all of that. Um, is NPS hiring? That's not one of the... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. We'll find the link for that because I think people should should be interested in that. And I think as any field right now, there's a shortage of staffing. So there is a better, better place to work. The library is also hiring friends. <laughs> um, Ranger Lara and Ranger Socorro, thank you very, thank you for a great presentation and for taking care of our lands and telling great stories. Absolutely, Victoria. Um, thank you. Um, okay, I don't see, I see lots of love. So if you, you two want to check out that, don't see much more questions. We answered the questions in the Q&A, except for Suzanne's question is how big is it? So I don't know exactly what that's referring to, but Suzanne, if you want to clarify your question on that one. <laughs> when is the Muni 70X going to start again? To, oh, I didn't know Muni went all the way out there. Ooh. When is the Muni 70X going to start oh, again? I want it. <laughs> Me too. We miss it. Good one. All right. I think we're going to call it last chance for questions, friends. And I'm going to throw this one more time into the chat box. And I'm going to add to this. This document is like a, a living document. So we add things to it. I noticed uh, Lisa, who's our tech host, thank you, Lisa, threw in some climate action book lists. You know, we love the book list. So I'll add those to the docs as well. And you can just access that doc anytime. Do you guys still have the big black and white photo of O Marincello at the headquarters? Scary what was planned. Yeah, I don't think we have it on display, but I definitely have used that photo in many social media posts. Um, it's I think it's on our website. There's a lot of interesting photos of what the Marin Headlands would have looked like if it was Marincello, a city of 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we, we definitely still have that in our archives for sure. That sounds like a program we need to have. We would be Ooh, stoked to give yeah. that program. It is <laughs> a fun one. The grassroots activism that led to this park is deeply inspiring. Ooh. Yeah, here's a little link from Found SF, which is a definitely reliable source. Um, they're part of the Shaping San Francisco Digital Archive. That sounds like we'll have to come back to that one, I think. Um, you have, NPS has an archive, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have an archivist. And then, yeah, a whole it's not warehouse. public though, right? Like a public person couldn't be like, come to the archive. I'm not sure. If mm. so, I mean, I know that we have to make an appointment when we go. Uh, yeah, then I um, Interesting. I'm not hmm. sure, yeah. I can add that to the document. I'll look it up too and see if we get any information about that. Um, uh, another program, oh, another program idea. <laughs> why all the military, why did all the military bases become parks? I always share that as a docent at the Mammal Center. I used to work at the Marine Mammal Center and I did a tour called From Missiles to Medicine. Oh. So yeah, that's, that's a fun one for sure. Ooh. These are great. Thanks for all these great ideas, library community. We know, we appreciate it and I will... I will bug our NPS soulmates about what we can do in our future.
All right, friends, thank you so much for being here. Lara and Sakura, thank you so much. Lisa, thank you for doing our tech in the back. And library community, as always, thank you. Have a good night. We love you. And, um, you know, there's hope. There is. We promise. We yes. Can, we can do something. All right. Come back and visit me Saturday morning at 11 a.m. when we hear about nature and the Quran. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye, everyone.